The Celtics had the most efficient offense in NBA history this season. Scoring over 123 points every 100 possessions, we've never seen a team put the ball in the basket quite at the rate that they did. And you'd think that would come with some ahead of its time advanced offensive scheme, like the 7 seconds or less Suns or the Warriors with their motion, but actually their approach is really simple. What they like to do is hunt for mismatches for their star wings to attack one on one. That could mean having one of their guards set a ball screen, that could mean having one of those wings set the screen for a guard, whatever it takes to get the switch they'll make it happen, and from there the game turns into a one on one. The thing is, this isn't anything new for the Mavs defense. Their first round matchup, the Clippers, played virtually the exact same way, and they hunted for the switch onto Luka Doncic on almost every possession. Dallas made it clear that instead of hiding Luka, they'd give up the switch. That way they can prevent a numbers advantage, and the reason this worked so well is they could exploit LA's roster. They don't have a single shooting big, so when Luka's out in space, their shot blockers can load up early in the paint. Luka gets beat off the dribble, but there's no opportunity at the rim. Luka's biggest weakness as a defender is his lateral quickness, and with the way they set up the floor, that wasn't at all a problem. He can position his body to guide the ball into help, where a big is just parked in front of the paint. Neither George nor Harden are very explosive slashers at this point, but they are still threats to get into the defense, and anytime either one got around Luka, they were running straight into a shot blocker. As a result, Luka could press up on the ball a lot more aggressively without having to worry about blowbys, knowing that there was always someone waiting behind him to protect the basket. And against a guy like Harden, that meant sitting on the step back. So not only was he not a liability, he was legitimately effective in isolation against the Clippers. Compare that to a play against the Celtics. Jalen Brown has Maxi Kleba on an island, easily gets by his hip, then when that big comes to help, it's an easy kick out to Al Horford who's spotted up for a corner three. Thankfully, this isn't anything new for the Mavs either. OKC is also a team that likes to hunt for mismatches and play one-on-one, -on -one, but like Boston, they have that five-out look with an outside shooter playing center. The problem for them was that their wings weren't respected. Lively can pre-rotate to help on a drive, while Kyrie drops to the dunker, and that's because they're willing to leave Lou Dort open. The same goes for Kenrich Williams. When j isolates from up top, Washington can sit at the elbow while Lively patiently waits under the basket. Luka can guide the ball towards that rim protection, and the result is a mid-range pull-up. This was most noticeable whenever Giddy was on the floor. Jones is gapping off of Dort to shut off the middle, forcing the ball baseline, and Lively isn't at all worried about Giddy, so he's rotated over, and all j has is another tough jumper. Even when they clear a side of the floor for Shea to take Luka one-on-one, Luka positions his body to force the ball middle, where Gafford's waiting to meet him. Shea counters with a nasty combo to create space, but instead of a layup, it's a long two, and that's the idea. Both Shea and Jadub are incredible mid-range scorers, yet those shots aren't nearly as efficient as spot-up threes or shots at the rim, and by attacking Luka one-on-one, -on -one, that's the diet that they had to live off of. Again, we can compare that to the Celtics. Jalen gets into the defense and kicks it to Holiday, who demands a closeout. One more pass finds Tatum, who happens to be a pretty good shooter himself. That tactic of gapping off of shooters to sit in driving lanes is a lot harder to execute when everyone on the floor is a legitimately great shooter, and leaving these guys with space might work sometimes, but isn't always ideal. So Boston brought some problems that they weren't prepared for. Here's one against the Clippers, where Kleba can cheat off of Westbrook as a non-shooting threat, protecting the nail, and Harden doesn't even try to drive, instead falling back on the step back three. Compare that to this play, where Kleba once again wants to cheat over and protect the middle, but instead of Westbrook on the wing, it's Sam Hauser who shoots 42% from three. Jalen easily gets down the lane and draws a foul at the rim. And that was pretty much the story of these mismatches. Luka lacks lateral quickness, Jalen's an explosive slasher, there's no early help, and you end up with plays like this. I will say, they had a little bit of success when it was Tatum, and they sort of zoned him up. Gafford pre-rotates to sit on the strong side block while Luka forces him baseline, where he uses his length to force a turnover. 
but the problem with playing like this is that if Tatum is able to put pressure on that second defender, the entire defense is forced into rotation, and you're back to hoping that Boston shooters aren't hitting on quality looks. I want to be very clear though. This wasn't only a Luka problem. They also hunted for the bigs out in space. Look at how they set up the court though. Porzingis is spotted up above the break, pulling away any nail help, and Holiday's in the dunker spot, meaning that Kyrie's the one protecting the rim. That forces Washington to rotate down, leaving another great shooter, Derek White, all alone in the corner. The Clippers also tried using that tactic of putting a guard in the dunker spot to make Kyrie a rim protector, but again, it's a lot different. Westbrook's on the floor, so Kleba can once again park himself in the middle, to which George is forced into settling for a much tougher look. The key here is that Boston's bigs are great shooters. With Al Horford in the corner, Kleba has to respect him, and with Kyrie protecting the rim, there really isn't going to be much resistance down low. Here's what it looked like when the Celtics instead had a big in the dunker spot. Now it's Lively who's under the basket, and believe it or not, he happens to be a significantly bigger presence. Not only is speed on the perimeter in these mismatches a problem though, Boston's size is every bit as much of an issue. Tatum can screen to get the switch onto Kyrie and seal off position in the middle. With the 5 out look, that's a 1 on 1, and he easily gets to the rim for a big time finish. A play later, they go to the exact same action, and Chris Dapps on the wing gives us all a good reminder of why you can't bring extra help to the paint. Speaking of which, Chris Dapps was maybe the biggest mismatch of all. He scored 20 points in 20 minutes of play, most of which were a result of him abusing smaller players one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't in the low post, but out in that 20-foot range, just turning and shooting over everyone who stood in his way. This is such a huge problem because once that mismatch is established, nothing you do behind the play matters. Lively pre-rotates, but he's not even looking to drive anyways. And it all comes back to the initial switch. Like I said, throughout the playoffs, they've been comfortable giving up mismatches that the rest of their defense can cover. Luka against agility, Kyrie against strength, but with the Celtics, that spacing kind of ruins this approach. The Celtics got into the defense quite literally every single time they wanted to. They got Chris Tapps a mismatch to attack in isolation every single time they wanted to. So in order for the Mavs to get back to defending like they have been, I think it'll take an adjustment in how they typically like to operate. They have to find a way to prevent dribble penetration, and that might mean not switching any actions. More hedging, more trapping, force them to play out on the perimeter and make decisions 25 to 30 feet away from the basket, as opposed to the drive and kick that completely picked them apart in game one. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you thought of this game. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.